everybody, welcome back to BP Simmons Television. My name is Mike Shoesmith. You know, there are some messages contained in the Bible which are open for debate, and we can have these discussions respectfully and while loving each other, in house sort of things, you know, in the church, we can talk about this and that, and whatever. We can even agree to disagree on some things, but there are certain messages which scream, which just leap out from the pages of the Bible. One of those messages is, move on. That is a message that is, that is so loud from the apostles, from Jesus himself. You know, Paul says in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count myself uh, to have apprehended. I count not myself to have apprehended, rather, but this one thing I do, this one thing I do, he says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And Jesus himself said in Luke 9.62, If you strap hold of the, the burden of, of being a follower of Jesus Christ and you look back, you are not worthy of the kingdom. So this is a powerful, powerful message. And it's a liberating message. I mean, people need to hear. People need permission to move on, to forget those things that lay behind and grab hold of the freedom that's in the cross, that's in Christ, that's in, that's in the future kingdom assignments that God has for you. You know, one of the ways that the devil keeps God's people from influencing and giving him a bloody nose is the, the guilt. He's the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says. The devil keeps God's people incapacitated uh, so that they don't do anything to, to stir up what he's doing in the world. So the devil puts all kinds of guilt on God's people and says, look, uh, look what you did to your wife, your kids at work. You took that donut when you shouldn't have. And this and that and this and that. But you know, the Bible has something to say about that. Move on. But you, how can you move on when you're strapped with this guilt or you've been taught that you have to perpetually confess each and every individual sin or if you die with unconfessed sin, straight to hell you'll go. I mean, who can live like that? It would be like being married to a woman who is constantly saying, if you do this, if you do that, I'm leaving, I'm out of here. I mean, you, how, what kind of marriage is that? The Bible has a specific message for the church. It is to keep moving forward in forgiveness. You are a forgiven person as an adopted child of God. So anyway, I put this message up on our Facebook page. It is a message that was taught by our resident... Uh, Bible expert, Carl Gallups, and uh, the message is, once saved, always saved. Carl does a Ask the Preacher show every Sunday morning. You can get that on WEBY every Sunday morning. Uh, it's a great way to do a little Bible study before you go to church. And uh, so I put this video teaching, it's about an hour long, on our Facebook page. And some people went on there with some scripture verses that they were concerned with. Uh, and uh, when all this was going on, I was on my Blackberry <laughs> out doing business. And it was, it's difficult to, to do a proper uh, teaching in, in the comment threads on Facebook when you're, you know, you're out and about doing business on a Blackberry, especially with my big thumbs. So what I did was I told the people, I said, look, we're going to make a video about this and get into more detail with this and uh, I'm going to see if I could get uh, Carl Gallops on the show and uh, Carl has agreed to come on and uh, talk to us about these verses that people are stumbling over and to help people get on with it because if there's one message that, that is screams at the church get on with it you're forgiven move on Carl are you there? I'm here, Mike. God bless you. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Listen, man, this is, uh, to me, uh, I don't know if you're as passionate about this as I am. I think you are. But, yes, I am. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. To me, uh, I think that would, would there be, you know, I live in Canada, would there be, if, if the church knew how powerful it was and the freedom it really had, would there be unfettered abortion in my country? Would there be homosexual marriage? And on and on and on. Would the church 
have allowed, you know, there's an old saying, as the church goes, so goes the nation. Would the church have allowed this in Canada, and would the church be allowing it in the United States? I wonder. So this is an important topic. People need freedom to move on. Do you agree? Mike, yeah, Mike listen, this is an eternally important topic. And, and before we delve into it, let me just say a couple of things here. Two things. First of all, thank you for advertising my uh, uh, Ask the Preacher show every Sunday morning. And and let me just tell your listeners and, and your viewers, uh, it, it's on every Sunday morning, and it's also on every Saturday afternoon. And so tell, tell I mean, I, I'll tell your viewers right now, it, just go to carlgallops.com, and at the top of the page, there's a little um, uh, announcement uh, board that tells you every day what show is coming up next, and it, whether it's Ask the Preacher or Freedom Friday or Open Mic and what shows I'm on. And then there's a link that says Listen Live. And so you've got it right there at carlgallops.com. It tells you when I'm on the air, what show it is, and then you click the link and you listen right there. So uh, I, I appreciate that. So not only is that Ask the Preacher on Sunday mornings, but it's on Saturday afternoons. And the second thing I wanted to say is, Mike, you have already nailed the entire topic with your intro. I, I can go ahead and hang up now, brother. Good <laughs> preaching. Good, good preaching. Well, thanks, Carl. I appreciate that. Listen, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you come here with 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 certain credentials that I don't have. And I, I mean, let's just be honest here. You are you are you are a graduate from seminary. You have been the lead pastor at a at a uh, at a uh, moderately large church in Pensacola or uh, Milton, Florida, which is just outside of Pensacola, Florida. I've been there. Uh, if any of you guys are watching, I miss you guys. I love you guys. I've been down there a couple of times. Uh, and uh, if you're ever in the Milton, Florida area, look them up. They're the Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in Milton, Florida, in the Gulf Coast area. Beautiful part of the world, by the way. Yeah, man, thank you so much. Yeah, I know. It's a it's a sweet little church. It's it's amazing. You know, statistically, proportionately, it's a mega church. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, and what I mean by that, on Sunday mornings, we'll run five, 600 people between the two services. But the thing is, our surrounding area, we only have three or 4,000 people that live there. So, you know, I mean, we're, I mean, we're, we're drawing a huge uh, amount of the people right around the church. And so, uh, of course, wow. if you go to high, high population areas, there may be three, four, five, ten thousand people in a church. And, of course, we don't live in a population area like that. Well, percentage-wise, you've got, like, 10 to 15 percent of the population is going to I guess, I, I guess. And, you know, a mega church is defined by if you have in attendance on a Sunday morning, Two percent or more of your surrounding population, then you're considered a mega church. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so for example, if you've got uh, no, excuse me, it's one percent or more. It's one percent or more. So, if you've got a two hundred thousand uh, population uh, center, uh, like a Pensacola, Florida, and your church is running two to three thousand in worship, then that's considered a mega church. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're yeah. like you're like a hyper mega church on steroids there in Milton. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But on the other hand, we have that feel of a smaller church, you know, and, and with the two services, a couple hundred in each service, um, then it, it just feels small and family-like, but yet it's big enough that we can get a lot of things done around the world, and, and we are. Uh, thank, uh, praise be unto the Lord. Well, here, here comes the big question. I know you're a busy guy and you've got a busy day ahead of you. Here comes the big question. Can I, can, can I lose my salvation? Yeah. Uh, yes, you can, but nobody else can. Oh, jeez. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me let, let me just explain this. This is how I know this is confusing, and I know that it's controversial with people, but I just want to deal with what the Word of God says. I, I don't care what cultural myths say or what denominational myths say, and, and I don't mean to be ugly, but I don't care what somebody's great-great-grandmother says or, or their pastor or their Sunday school teacher. I always, you know, what does the Word of God say? Right. And the bottom line is this, Mike. Here's how I say it. People, you know, look, there are two extremes to this teaching. There's the one extreme, uh, which you've just extrapolated upon a moment ago, and that is that you can lose your salvation at any given moment. And as you so beautifully illustrated, that's like being in a marriage where your spouse tells you, look, it, you know, at any moment, if you displease me, I'm out of here. Well, that would be a miserable, horrible relationship. And, and let's face it, salvation is a relationship with God. Certainly, he's not that unfaithful to us. Certainly, he's not, you know, not just going to leave us because 
because we've disappointed him one day. So there's that extreme, though. There is a teaching out there that basically says you can lose your salvation. And not only can you lose it, but you can pretty much lose it at any given point. Right. Um, then the other extreme, and here's, here's what people are reacting to, Mike. The other extreme on the far right is, look, once you're saved, you're always saved. It doesn't matter what you do after that. It doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle you're living. Um, uh, you, you know, once you're saved, you're saved. Now, the, the, I understand people's problem with that because somebody, quote, makes a profession of faith. They, quote, get baptized. They join a church. They declare they're a Christian. And then, you know, years later, they start living in debauchery. And then they go around saying, oh, but I'm saved. Right. And so people, people react to that. But here's what I say, Mike, those are the two extremes, and neither one of those statements is biblical. Here's the biblical statement. Once you are saved, you are always saved if you are truly born again. And That's the, now what, yeah. what would you say, what would you say, now would you say then, now the, the, a concern came up in the comment section of the, in, in Facebook, you know, members can comment and, and generally, generally it is a, is a respectful uh, interchange. I did have to kick somebody out yesterday because, because he said God hates and this guy, I mean, this guy, he just, he was just ugly. So he came out of the woodwork, he's gone. Another guy came on, I'm not going to name names, he, he, he gave us a bunch of scriptures and started preaching the, you have to perpetually confess your sins, otherwise that particular sin will keep you out of heaven. So that's the other extreme, right? And he yeah, uses right. verses like, he uses verses like, Revelation 3, 5, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. I will not erase his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father, before the angels. And then he says, now he's preaching a message in the comment section of P.P. P. Simmons. Right? Right. Well, right. if your message doesn't line up with ours, if you're leading people into a place of fear, then that you are not welcome with us. That yeah, message please. is not welcome, right? Well, you know, you know the scripture he quoted, Revelation three. I mean, that's a statement of the eternal security of the believer. All that means, Jesus is just saying, "Hey, look, you're secure. Your your salvation is secure. Your name will not be blotted out of the book of life. It's there. It cannot be. It will not be. I will not do it. Uh, you are secure in your salvation." So he's taken that beautiful promise of scripture and given it the opposite meaning, Mike. And he, he's living a fear-based relationship with God because he, he then gives his interpretation. He says, this means your name can be erased unless you endure to the end. He yeah. says, in other well, words, you had salvation until your name was blotted out. Yeah, well, actually, contextually, that's not what it means. And you know that, of course. Right. And, and uh, thank you for throwing this softball to me. Uh, <laughs> because, because what that is, Jesus is simply confirming the fact that once you are uh, born again under the blood of Jesus, you are an overcomer. Uh, you, you, if you are truly born again, you will endure to the end. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't stumble from time to time. Goodness. Right. I mean, I, I mean, daily I have to say things like, you know, Lord, man, I, I messed that up. Please forgive me, you know. Right. But I never, I never am in fear of the loss of my salvation. What I'm in fear of, like a child who lovingly uh, uh, adores and yet reverently fears uh, their, their, their loving parents, parent, I, I want to please my, my heavenly father. And plus, I don't want to endure the consequences of my sin uh, that go, my sin that goes unchecked, undealt with, unconfessed. And so, but I never worry about the loss of my salvation. I, I what I want to do is to make sure that I'm pleasing my heavenly father and that, uh, and that I don't continue on in the stupidity of that particular sin. So, uh, yeah, so, so what Jesus is doing in that passage of scripture is just declaring it, the, the security of the believer as, as as you know, that, look, you're, you're an overcomer in Jesus Christ. You're under the blood. Um, you know, stay in that. Walk in that. Hold your head high. Your, your name will not be blotted out of the book of life. Don't worry. Don't fear. Like that grand old hymn says, our victory is in Jesus, my Savior forever. Now, would you, now I'm going to make a statement about this, and there's one more verse I want you to get into, and I think after we tackle the next verse in Hebrews, and you probably know which one it is, after we tackle, oh, after oh, we listen, ta listen, yeah, listen, not only do I know that verse, but it's one of my f most favorite to talk about, and I was praying right before the show that you would bring that up, so let's, let's have at it, but go all ahead. All right, now this is Revelation 3, 5, I just want to say something here, and I want you to tell me if I'm right. Yeah. 
He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. The he who overcomes there. Uh, I, I have I have come to believe that since since the Bible is clear that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us and and uh, uh, nothing is greater than than the than the uh, sin redemption bought with the blood of Jesus. Right. Once we delve into 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 this uh, deeper as far as who Jesus is, Hebrews twelve two says Jesus is the author and finisher of my faith. He is, not right. me. Philippians right. Philippians one six says being confident that he who began a work in you, he who began a work in you, will perform it until Jesus returns. Right? Galatians 3.3 says, It is foolishness that having once begun, begun in, to move forward in the Spirit, so you've been purchased, born again, adopted by the Spirit of God, that you would continue, that you would try to make it happen on your own by your own works. You know that uh, Paul calls that witchcraft. Absolutely. And Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. By grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. That's anyone who both. So when I look at Revelation 3, 5, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase. He who overcomes is evidence of who you are. Not exactly. That, not that you have to overcome yourself, because the Bible is crystal clear. Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. Not yes, you. Yes, Mike brilliantly stated what you have done is you have taken that passage of Scripture in its context, not only in its immediate context in Revelation, but you've put it within its biblical context, and more importantly, you've put it within the context of, uh, of, of the teachings of Jesus Christ himself, and, and, and your interpretation is spot on, contextually accurate. Let me, let me just settle it. Let's just use the words of Jesus, John chapter 10, verse 10, my sheep hear my voice, right. and and I know them, and they follow me, mm -hmm. and I give unto them eternal life. How long is eternal, Mike? Forever and ever. Okay, watch this. And 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 I give unto them eternal life. No one, no one. shall snatch them out of my hand. No one shall take. And I, I'm just paraphrasing here, but but how many's how many's no one? That not even I can't no. even do it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Satan can't do it. No one. So no one. Right. So this is the this is the these are the words of Jesus Himself. Now to say that once you're born again you can lose your salvation, you're calling Jesus a liar. He said, "Look, my sheep. That who are they? Oh, those are those that belong to Him. Uh, those are those that are born again. The only way you can belong to Jesus is to be born again." Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus that in John chapter three. He said, "Nobody will see the the kingdom of of, of heaven unless he's born again." So Jesus goes on to say, "Now my sheep." Those that are born again, you know, I they hear my voice, they follow me, and I know them, and I give unto them eternal life. Now, this is what Jesus says, Mike. Mike, that one statement settles the whole matter. Now, of course, we're going to look at other scriptures, and but we're going to put them in context. And and you know, as you were talking there, it, that is it, actually this is actually another video altogether. But Jesus actually says. In, in that, in that, uh, in those verses, that there's no such thing as a Christian turned atheist, <laughs> because, <Yeah. laughs> because you know, atheism denies the existence of the supernatural world, supernatural realm, and yet Jesus Himself says, if you don't know me and hear me and follow my voice, then you're not, you you've never known me, right? <laughs> and so, if a Christian knows Jesus, how could he possibly be an atheist? So, <laughs> right, a absolutely. Listen, listen. No, you're absolutely right. Listen, I want to make this correction. I, I just uh, opened my Bible in front of me. <laughs> Believe it or not, I've got a Bible here. Yeah. I just, <laughs> but it's John. It's John chapter ten. I said verse ten. That's where that whole diatribe starts. But the verses I quoted, John chapter ten, verse twenty-seven, twenty-eight, and twenty-nine. Let, let, let me just read it. it. Says, "My sheep." hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, Mike, eternal life, eternal. that is forever. Right. And they shall never perish. Never. How long is never? How never. long is never? Never, never? never, never, And then he says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. Now listen to what he says in two sentences. He says, I know them, they're mine, all right? The next sentence. And in the next sentence, he makes a threefold declaration of the eternal security of the believer. He says, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. 
No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then the next verse, he goes on to tell us the power behind that. He says, because it is my Father who has given them to me, he is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and the Father are one. So, I mean... I mean, to me, that just settles it. Now, that settles it. Now, all we have to do is look at other scriptures and ask, what do these mean in the context of what Jesus said? That's right. I mean, that's the, to me, that's one of the three C's of Bible study. One of them, one of the C's is, I'll have to do a video about this later, but one of the C's is conflation. You have to take everything the Bible says about a topic, conflate it into one common understanding, then you will know the mind of God on that topic. And that's what we're trying to do here. Right. But... Uh, so what? Now, that to me, that's saying that not even Carl Gallops can snatch Carl Gallops out of his hand. Yeah. Well, you know what? I know a lot of people argue that, and uh, but I would say that that's absolutely right. I mean, no one includes even Carl Gallops. Now, what do you do? Another verse came to mind here. What do you do with the verse that says, and I, 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 in my preparation work, I didn't write down the chapter and verse. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, correct me if I'm oh, wrong. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. But what it's saying is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Salvation is fully in you if you're saved. Yep. But yep. don't yep. hide your salvation under a bushel and just live your life to make money, thanking God for everything. Uh, work it out. Salvation right. is so powerful that you could be a mountain mover. But you've got to yeah. work it out. It's in you. Work it out of you. Get it going. You know, ga ga gas up your engine and get going. You know, but you know, right? You we all have assignments from God. Well, you know, let me let me go, go ahead, ahead and just tell, let me just let me comment before we move on. Yeah. That, that word that's translated into English, work out. Right. It comes from the Greek word. It's a long Greek word. I'm not going to bore your listeners. But if you'll look it up in any Greek dictionary, it's, it's in Strong's uh, Concordance. It's key to number 2716. And that word work out means, listen to this, Mike. Yeah. It, means, it means accomplish or finish. In other words, work it out to its end with fear and trembling. It has nothing to do with earning your salvation. Right. The, 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 the statement that's being made from Paul uh, to Philemon is, look, as you are now saved, so, so go to the very end of your salvation experience with fear and trembling. In other words, you know, you're going to stumble along the way, but when you do, get it right with God. Uh, please your heavenly father work out your salvation work it all the way to its complete end it has nothing to do with earning your salvation by works but rather see a lot of a lot of understanding is lost in translation of, of greek to english but but that's what the greek word means anybody can look it up it doesn't mean uh, uh, to, to to that you earn your salvation by works but it means that you are you're finishing your walk with jesus well look paul said it like this I have fought the fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and that kept the faith just means he has been faithful to the end, to what God has called him to do. So that's, that's what that passage means, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't mean we're earning our salvation, it means that we are finishing our faith well. We're finishing well, we endeavor to finish well. And, and in fact, Paul says, when, when Paul is referring to, being, to his concern about being disqualified, He's not concerned about losing his salvation. He's concerned. He's concerned that that uh, there are certain crowns, rewards, and he wants them oh, yeah. all. He wants all oh, yeah. of it, right? Well, here's yeah, and here's my illustration of that: the great biblical truth. Again, in the context of John chapter ten, verse twenty-seven, where Jesus says, "You're not going to lose your salvation." So when 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 Paul says that uh, he wants to make sure that he's not disqualified, he's using a sports terminology. So look, Satan only has two plans that he can accomplish in a person's life, Mike. One of them is to destroy somebody's soul uh, forever, to keep someone separated from God forever. That's Satan's ultimate spit in God's face. Satan doesn't care about you, Mike. He doesn't care about me. What he wants to do is to spit in God face. So he will use Mike Shoesmith. He will use Carl Gallops. If he can keep Mike and Carl out of heaven and out of the Father's kingdom, then he has spit in God's face. Now that's Satan's plan A. But when Mike and Carl come under the blood, now Satan cannot touch our eternal security because Jesus says, you know, I give them eternal life. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. They shall never perish. Okay, so now Satan's plan A is gone in Mike's life. It's gone in Carl's life. But watch this. 
is Satan finished with Mike or Carl? No, he's got a plan B. What is that? To disqualify us, to take us out of the game, to sit us on the bench. How does he do that? By immersing us, tempting us in sinful activities that destroy our witness, that destroy our credibility. Look, let's face it, Mike. I, you and I have a worldwide presence on the Internet and through books we write and radio programs. We have a worldwide ministry. We have a worldwide influence. Praise God. God has given us that. You know what? You and I can be disqualified from that work. Oh, yeah. I can go off. I can go off into all manner of sin today, and then and then say, you know what, God, I was stupid. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And I can do business with God, and I can get all that right with the Lord, and my salvation is secure. But I may have disqualified myself from my worldwide ministry. Right. I may not have an impact. People won't want to listen to me anymore. Right. Well, that that doesn't mean I'm not saved. It just means I've been disqualified. And the Apostle Paul was just simply stating that fearful statement, uh, something that I pray all the time, Lord, please don't let me do something so stupid that I disqualify myself. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I never doubt my salvation, but I'm more concerned now about my witness integrity and my witness influence. And that's what that passage means. And, and you know, there's a sad trail of disqualified uh, saints even in our modern times. I mean, you and oh, yeah. I, you and I yeah. could name names. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I, I will just use this example because everybody in the world knows it. I, I remember when Jimmy Swaggart fell into sexual sin. Now, prior to that, he had a worldwide ministry with huge impact. And I, I mean, just huge impact. I don't agree with all of his theology, but I'm just saying, I'm using him as an example. All right. To this day, he still has a ministry. He still has a church. He's still preaching the gospel. I believe, you know, if, if, if he was saved in the first place, then, then he's always been saved. He's still saved. But watch, he no longer has the worldwide influence. His influence has gone down the drain. But yet, you know, he's still saved and he's still doing the work of God. So there's, there's a modern day example. Yeah, and uh, we can just look at Jim Baker. I mean, Jim Baker's a great example. I mean, where is he? Uh, he 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 he's you know he he has repented. He's he's uh, you know back in the in the fold again. But you know, where is he? Nobody knows where he is. He's been disqualified right. essentially. Right, right, and, and that's, that's all that means. All that's all that Paul was talking about. And so when he writes Timothy from prison in Second Timothy chapter four, he finishes. He's finishing his life. He knows he's going to die. And what does he say to Timothy? He says, Timothy, look. He says, the time has come for my departure. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm, I, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, I'm excited about it. Uh, there are crowns laid up for me, but also for you, Timothy, and for anyone who, who longs uh, you know, to serve the Lord like we have. He says, but here's the final deal, Timothy. I fought the fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. And therefore, you know, God, God is getting ready to reward me. That's all that Paul was ever concerned about after he was saved. He was never concerned about losing his salvation. His concern was that he would not finish well and thus bring disgrace upon the gospel work, and, which, of course, he did not do that. He did finish well, and he did not bring disgrace. But that was his concern when he said, I, I, I fear being disqualified. You know, I, I, uh, the Bible speaks of, of the, of the uh, mystery of adoption. To where we become adopted children of God, right? Yep. Yep. It's only through adoption that that we are born again and saved. We become adopted into the family of God through adoption, and the lock on the adoption agency door was sin. Sin was dealt with on the cross. Jesus took away the sin of the world. It is not a hindrance to being being a member of the family of God any longer. Right. What, what I've been involved in adoptions a couple of times. In fact, we're in the process now of adopting a, a young lady who we, who we rescued from the Children's Aid Society here in Canada. And uh, when she first came here, she would just hide in her room. She, she wouldn't come, she wouldn't, she would always, she would be almost like beggarly. She, she, she didn't, uh, she didn't, she'd been from house to house to house to house. We, it took, it's been a year now. And finally, she is uh, she is opening the fridge door without you know begging for permission. She right. she is acting like a shoesmith now, but right. but she still has dreams, nightmares that we are going to abandon her. Right. To this day, even a year on, and God's people 
uh, are, are trapped in this in this fear, this bondage that right. they won't be accepted by you know. Uh, we cry out to God uh, and uh, through the spirit of adoption, and we cry, "Abba, Father, He's our Dad," right. and we have permission to go out into the kingdom and do right. the kingdom stuff and have fun with our dad and and you know some people liken it to just crawling up on his lap you know I, I was telling my wife the other day I feel like I crawled up on his lap about three years ago and never left <laughs> that's, right. that's right so that's right. so we we here at PP Simmons if there's one message we will not tolerate it is the message that you have to earn your way up into your father's approval he loves, he, he loves you, he, and like Carl has been trying to tell you for the last 15 minutes, he will never, 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 never leave you. And evidence that you are one of his is that you move from one state to another to another, and the sins of your past become strangely dim. It's as if, it's as if, who is that person from 10 years ago? I look back at that person and I think, man, that guy was crazy. I would never associate with that guy. So that is the evidence of who you are. If a person uh, says a prayer in a church and, and uh, walks away and, and there's no change, there's no evidence of that this person has been uh, adopted into a new family, if there's no evidence that, that this, this young lady is becoming a shoe smith, then, then is she, has she really been... Is she really here? She could leave and we'd never miss her. But right. this girl has been adopted and uh, we would miss her terribly. She's my daughter now. Right, right. No, that, that's a beautiful illustration. And it's one that Paul uses, is one that the scripture uses, the one of adoption. And, you know, Mike, I, and I do want to, I'm really anxious, of course, you know, I'm going to let you lead the way, of course, but I'm anxious to get to those scriptures in Hebrews because yeah. I, I know I know what they are. But, but again, Mike, I just, you know, in addition to what you just said, let me put the exclamation point on what you just said. I go right back. I mean, this settles it for me. Either Jesus is God in the flesh, who is the only way of salvation, who provided for our sins, or he's not. Now, of course, I believe he is. Now, if he is, then what he says about salvation is what I believe. And he says in John chapter 10, verse 28, I give them, and of course, them, his sheep, those who are born again, eternal life, number one, and they shall never perish, number two. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Number three, three times he declares the eternal security of the believer who is truly born again. Now, that's those are the words of Jesus, Mike. So every scripture that has anything to do with salvation has to be interpreted in light of what Jesus himself said. Don't you agree? You know, that's a, hundred, that's a good point, really. I mean, if, if somebody comes up to you, Carl, if I said to you, Carl, I just added two even numbers and I came up with an odd number, you wouldn't have to check it. You would just go, oh, Matt, you're wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, better read, you better redo your math because you can't add two even numbers and come up with an odd number. Exactly. And, good, good, good illustration. Right, and the even number here is... Jesus paid it all. And, you know, even Revelation 3, 5 confirms that. He says, if you overcome, and Paul says, we're more than overcomers. So we've got right. that covered, no problem. It's not that we have to, he doesn't say, you have to become more than an overcomer. He says, we are more than overcomers, right? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and uh, Romans eight fourteen says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they shall try to become, perhaps maybe are the sons of God. No, it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's right. All right, so let's, right. let's move on here. Uh, the next one, people use this a lot, and they use Hebrews to to uh, put the fear and bondage back on people. Hebrews 10, 26, 27. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. <laughs> and the fury, Carl, the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. So, yeah. then, so then his interpretation is, in other words, you can end up in hell for sin. Salvation is not a license for sin. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, Mike, you know what? Can you turn me loose on this for just a moment? It's all yours. I'll just sit back in okay. my chair. <laughs> okay. Well, again, let's deal with the C word, context. 
the C word. That's such a that's such an uh, 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 inconvenient word for those who delve off into uh, into heresy. Uh, you know, but if we're going to deal with chapter ten, verse twenty six and twenty seven, we got to go all the way back to verse one. Really, we're going to go all the way back to chapter six, but. All, verse 1 of chapter 10 says, The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. So, in other words, the point that the writer of Hebrews is making is, look, oh wait, let's just stop with this, Mike. Right. It's called the book of what? Hebrews. Hebrews. You're right. So it, it's written to who? To Hebrews. When? 2,000 years ago. What was going on? The church was being born. For the first couple of decades of the early Christian church, the vast majority of its members were Hebrews. Now, one of the greatest heresies in the early Christian church was that of Judaism. What was that? That, okay, Jesus is our Messiah, but the way that you're really saved is Jesus plus keeping all the laws. Jesus plus keeping all the commandments. Jesus plus. And so Paul had to fight against this continually. Uh, John, the Apostle John, as he got older and and and, and, and wrote some of the scriptures, uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, he dealt with this. Um, Peter dealt with this top, this deal of the Judaizers. Now the writer of Hebrews is dealing with it. He's writing to the Hebrews in the early Christian church, and he's saying, look, forget keeping the law every day. Uh, verse 4, he says, he says, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, if you come down to verse 26, he says, so therefore, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we, we have received, watch this, the knowledge of the truth... No sacrifice for sin is left. He's talking to Hebrews who have come in contact with the gospel. Mike, does the knowledge of the truth save anybody? No, I mean, of, co of, co not. of course not. That's right. No, no. Knowledge of the truth is where we begin, but then we have to come over to surrendering ourselves to that truth, which is the lordship of Jesus Christ. See, Satan has knowledge of the truth, Mike. But he's not saved. That's right. Satan knows the word of God backwards and forwards. He has knowledge of the truth. So this passage of scripture is not talking to born again Christians who struggle with their sin nature. He's talking to Hebrews who were coming in contact with the knowledge of the gospel of the truth. They were in the early Christian church and they were spreading heresy, declaring that, look, it's Jesus plus uh, keeping the laws. And the writer of Hebrews says, no, no, if you, because if that's the way you're going to do it, then you will never be saved because you cannot keep all the laws and the blood of goats and heifers and, and, and it will never save anybody now. Jesus has died once for all and after that the judgment. So that's the context of Hebrews 10. But it really, now watch this Mike, it really goes all the way back to Hebrews 6. Now this passage of scripture um, it, it is where where he's playing off of of Hebrews 10. Listen to this, Mike. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance, because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Now that passage is used all the time to say, see there, you can lose your salvation. But, but the answer is as clear as the nose on your face. No. Listen to those words again. First of all, if this passage says you can lose your salvation, you know what this passage also says? It's impossible to get it back. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, can't, it can't be meaning that. No. Listen to what it says. It is. Now remember, who's he writing to? Hebrews. That's right. In the early Christian church who were the Judaizers. Mm -hmm. And he says to them, it's impossible for you if you have been enlightened. Mike, does being enlightened save anybody? No, no sir. No, no. All right. Those of you who have tasted the heavenly gift. Folks, uh, Mike, if somebody comes into my church, Hickerhammock, on Sunday morning, and we're worshiping in the Spirit, and we're singing praises, and I'm preaching the Word, and people are getting saved, if you're sitting there, you're tasting of the heavenly gift. But does that make you saved? No, sir. Of course not. And then it says, it's impossible for those who have once been enlightened, for those who have tasted the heavenly gift, for those who have shared in the Holy Spirit. And again, that person sitting in Hickory Hammock on Sunday morning, he's sharing in the Holy Spirit. 
He is being enlightened. I guarantee you at Hickory Hammock, he's being enlightened. He's tasting the heavenly gift that's available to all. And then it says, for those, it says, but if you fall away, fall away from what? If you fall away from that, if you fall away from the truth, he says it's impossibly to be brought back from repentance. Now, what he's saying to the Hebrews is, look, if you're going to cling to salvation is through the law, even after you've tasted of this heavenly gift, even after you've been enlightened to the truth of the gospel, even after you've shared in the working and the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, and you walk away from that and say, you know what, I'm going to stick to the law. He says, you know what? It's impossible for you to come to repentance because now you're crucifying Jesus all over again. What does that mean? Well, the reason Jesus went to the cross was to do away with the penalty of the law. So, so Hebrews chapter 6 is not talking about losing salvation. It's a plea to Hebrews who are insisting that, that legalism is the way to salvation. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 27 is a continuation of that same theme uh, evidenced by Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 and he says now if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth then there's no sacrifice for sin why is that because if you're rejecting Jesus Christ's salvation then there is no sacrifice for sin so Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 6 these are nothing more than great um, proponents of what you and I know the Bible uh, teaches, what Jesus said in John chapter 10. Look, if you belong to me, you'll never perish. The problem is you've got to belong to me. You can't base your salvation upon works and legalism. Did, did I say, now did I say all that correctly, Mike? Was I clear enough? Well, I, I you know, I, that's why we have you on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I love helping people to see this in Hebrews because people always go to Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 to, to prove that you can lose your salvation. When as a matter of fact, when you put those verses in their proper context, book context, historical context, biblical context, and Christology context, when you put it in their proper context, the, the meaning of them is plain. It has nothing to do with losing your salvation. It has everything to do with, look, you better come to Jesus or you're not really saved. You know, as you were, as you were talking there, you were sort of painting a picture in my mind anyway. Uh, Hebrews 10, 26, 27, For if we go on sinning willfully after the knowledge of the truth, you know, I'm reminded of the, of the uh, article recently I read where, where the Russians are now evacuating their people out of Syria. That's a bad thing. Russia only has one, one military outpost uh, apart from their military establishment in Russia, and that military outpost is in Syria. <laughs> if, once, they, once they shut that down, there is, there is, Russia is isolated. So, but now it's gotten so bad over there that they're going to evacuate all their people out of Syria. Now, if, you go, if the Russian uh, military comes to Syria and says to all the Russian people, look, this is the last, this is the last, uh, this is the last escape out of here. This is it. If you don't get on now, the knowledge of the truth here is, if you don't get on this plane, you're stuck here. And all hell's about to break loose. And uh, so let's, now let's say we got this one guy. He's like, oh, you know, I got this girlfriend here. And uh, I, I think I'll just, I, I believe there's another way off. So I'm just going to wait it out. What the writer of Hebrews is saying is, there's nothing left. There is no more salvation for you. This is it. And did I say that right? Is that a good? The, the, yeah. the, the only thing left for you after this plane leaves this this uh, this hellhole is the terrifying expectation that that bombs are going to start dropping. <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, does that paint a good picture for it? Oh, no, it does. It's a beautiful illustration, Mike. It's perfect. It, it's great. I'm so glad that you've used it. And and uh, can I just wrap up Hebrews 10 Let's while we're it. right here? I mean, I mean, after that illustration, I've, I've got to say this. All right. Again, again, to our viewers and listeners who want to use the Hebrews uh, chapter 6 and chapter 10, especially chapter 10, verse 26 and 27, if we deliberately keep on sinning, you know, there's no sacrifice left for our sins. I, I, just, want to, I just want to say again, remember... Verse 1, the first few words, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. All right, what's the good thing that's coming? Well, it's the gospel. It's the gospel and salvation that's coming to us through the blood of Jesus. So the chapter opens 
by condemning those Hebrews who are clinging to the law. And then we come down uh, to the middle of, of this chapter, um, verse 19, where it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by, it doesn't say by the law, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. All right. How? Through the blood of Jesus. Now you come down to verse 28 and, or excuse me, 26, and it says, But if we deliberately, if you, if you deliberately keep on sinning after you've received the knowledge of this truth, then no sacrifice for sin is left. I mean, how much clearer could you be, Mike? It's not talking about losing your salvation. He's pleading with Hebrews who believe that their salvation is through the law. And he's saying, no, the better way has been opened, the blood of Jesus. But if you're going to cling to the law, which proves that you are a sinner, and you keep on sinning deliberately after having received the knowledge of the gospel, then no sacrifice for your sin is left. That's the context of Hebrews chapter 10. Carl Gallops, we're so glad to have you on board here with us. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. We'll end it there, and uh, we'll talk to you next time, uh, uh, probably on the radio. Yeah, well, I, I look forward to it, Mike. And let me just tell your listeners again, John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, I give my sheep eternal life. They shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my Father's hand. To say otherwise is to call Jesus a liar. That was the great Carl Gallus. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you. God bless you, Mike. Well, listen, everybody, you guys have assignments from God that it will be your great pleasure to do. But this one thing you have to do, you have to do just like Paul did, move on. Forget those things that lay behind, you are forgiven. If you stumble, like Pastor Carl said, pick yourself up, thank you God for my, for my forgiveness, as evidence that you are saved, that you are adopted, this is what will happen to you. Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. You don't have to work your way into it. Enjoy your adoption as a son of God. My name is Mike Shoesmith, and we'll see you guys next time. Do you ever wish that you could more powerfully, succinctly, and accurately speak to the message of your Christian faith and the Word of God? This is the book you need, The Magic Man in the Sky, Effectively Defending the Christian Faith. This book has been featured on TBN, Atlanta Live, dozens of radio programs in hundreds of markets. It was rave reviewed by the Washington Times and it was called a must read book. Considering the times in which we now live, you need this book. Get it today on Amazon.com or the WND Superstore.